Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this critical Zoom meeting. Uh, this meeting is organized by Women's Platform for Equality, shortly ESHIC, which means threshold. Today, we are crossing a threshold, I believe. I want to say welcome to our distinguished guest, uh, all attendees from uh, Eastern Europe, other countries, and the dearest ESHIC platform members. We would like to thank to UNFPA Turkey <clears throat> for sponsoring translation of this meeting. Didem and Saliha will be our translators today. Thanks to Didem and Saliha too. Uh, during COVID-19, as women's moment in Turkey, we had to struggle with several issues, as you all do in whichever country you live in. Today, we will talk about Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, also known as, very well known as Istanbul Convention, which is now under the attack of, attack of fundamentalist, ultra right-wing groups, extreme conservatives, misogynists, and the governments. As the attacks continue, we will continue to de defend our lives and our rights. Since then, we are having a Zoom meeting every week. We held our 23rd uh, Zoom meeting yesterday. Although it seems that uh, this, is, uh, this issue has taken backseat in Turkey, we know that it has not disappeared and it will come up one day. So we have to be vigilant always. Just a week ago, Poland has begun diplomatic efforts in neighboring countries to rally support for Family Rights Convention. This is an effort to form a bloc in European Union against Istanbul Convention. In this regard, we have to carry our struggle beyond the borders and collaborate and fight jointly with the International Women's Movement. This meeting will allow us to learn about each other's struggles and discuss strategies for working together and empowering each other. And our dream is to make this treaty a worldwide cornerstone of the gender equality. This is our dream. Uh, let me tell about something, how we will have the meeting. The meeting will be held in, uh, two, in fact, two parts, in fact, three parts. In the first part, we will have speakers from Turkey, Poland, Croatia, Bulgaria, and Hungary. This part will be held in English and will be translated into Turkish. The second part will be an open forum and the translation will be available in both languages. And the third part will be closing remarks. I will be moderating the first part. Uh, let me read briefly my short bio. <laughs> Fatma Aytaç, that's me, is a feminist activist, member of Women's Platform for Equality Turkey, founder and co-chair of Women's Party of Turkey, and founder and chair Woman of Red Paper Association. She is an alumni of Boziçi University, Industrial Engineering, and Anadolu University Sociology. She has 25 years of private sector experience, 15 years in IT management, and five years of, uh, which was as a chief information officer of a Turkish conglomerate. Now, <clears throat> our first speaker is. Uh, before uh, before uh, giving the floor to uh, Feridoja, I kindly remind each speaker to complete her own part in designated time. We have another important request from our speakers. Please suggest what these groups can do together that will strengthen the fight and make it more effective from the perspective of women's organization in your country. We will appreciate if you spend two, three minutes in your speech on this issue. 
Uh, and please write your name and countries in the uh, participants' uh, part. Uh, thanks again for all your toil, tireless effort, and thanks being with us. Uh, our first speaker, Professor Ferid Ajar, former chair of Gravio. Let me briefly read Ferid Hanım's uh, bio. Ferid Ajar is Professor Emerita, Department of Political Science and Public Administration, Middle East Technical University. Professor Ajar founded the Gender and Women's Studies graduate, pro graduate program at Middle East Technical University and has lectured and published extensively on topics related to gender equality and women's rights. She was former chairperson of the UN CEDAW Committee from 2003 to 2005 and was involved in the drafting Council of Europe Convention on Prevention and Combating Violence Against uh, Women and Domestic Violence, <clears throat> Istanbul Convention. She was later elected the founding president of his monitoring organ, uh, Gravio. Professor Ajar was awarded Human Rights Award by Government of Canada in 2018 and the Council of Europe Pro Merito Medal in 2019 for her work on gender equality and women's human rights. She's an alumni of Middle East Technical University and Bryn Mawr College. Feride Hoca, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me in this uh, very important meeting as a speaker, as a uh, um, introductory speaker. I will not be speaking about in, uh, what's happening in Turkey, but other, uh, my colleague after following in the following presentation, we'll do that. Now, uh, this present gathering of feminists supporting the Istanbul Convention is unfortunately mostly prompted by the negative attitude expressed by some ultra-conservative misogynist uh, uh, and uh, like groups in several countries who are actually opposed to gender equality and women's human rights. Lately, they also seem to have uh, receptive ears uh, from several governments. This reactionary attitude is expressed in uh, calls to reject the Istanbul Convention altogether or to alter its contents or to disregard it and not implement it at the national level. In the latter part of the meeting, uh, we will hear from activists from different countries about their specific experiences and perspectives regarding this most pressing urgent challenge that is the backlash uh, to the Istanbul Convention. I am asked here, I was asked uh, to briefly talk about the positive and negative lessons learned in the implementation of the Istanbul Convention. Um, in other words, the improvements and the shortcomings we actually see in the, uh, as a result of the, of the process of implementing the Istanbul Convention. Uh, I'd like to recognize at this point that my very dear colleague, Biljana Brankovic, who is also a member of the Gravio Committee, is currently among us, I see, and Biljana will, I'm sure, complete uh, any, anything I leave out. Now, the Istanbul Convention, as you know, came into force in 2014, and uh, its monitoring body is Gravio, uh, that started its visits and examination of states in 2015. To date, 14 countries have been monitored by Gravio and uh, monitoring is going on even during the days of this uh, pandemic. My short summary of the improvements and challenges uh, will be uh, uh, made to, so as to lay the factual basis for the upcoming discussion. Let me start on the positive note, improvements since the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, most positive change is observed uh, is actually observed in the legal area. Uh, now we all know that changes in the laws are absolutely necessary, but they are not sufficient. So what we see has happened in many countries is that the convention uh, has led to criminalization of more forms of violence in uh, many countries that have been uh, monitored. And uh, these new uh, uh, criminal provisions 
have led to uh, the uh, public perception, hopefully, of seeing uh, certain forms of behavior as violence against women when it was not so, uh, it was not done so in the past. Uh, new criminal offenses have been also introduced into the laws, for instance, stalking, and as far as Europe is concerned, FGM, of course, and forced marriage and forced sterilization have been criminalized in some countries. Also, uh, as change in the laws, uh, prosecution of sexual offenses on the basis of use of force, for instance, uh, uh, sexual offenses like uh, rape, uh, on the basis of use of coercion is uh, changed in the laws of some countries to uh, defin defining of that crime as lack of freely given consent. Uh, national action plans are made, updated, or are put into implementation in several states. And training, a lot of training has been going on of professionals, security personnel, health and education sector professionals, and particularly judges and prosecutors. And also some improvements on the services have, uh, are observed, for instance, in terms of in the shelters, number of shelters and the distribution of shelters in the countries, crisis centers, as well as increased services for rape victims and some dedicated telephone hotlines. Uh, now, in a few countries, we also see that there is increased funding for services and uh, there is a limited but some improvement in considering women's special experiences in uh, consideration of uh, in, de in determining refugee status. So these are the good news part. This is the good news part. The uh, challenges to the implementation of the Istanbul Convention, the major challenge of the uh, convention are attributable to uh, these well entrenched institutional, economic and cultural and attitudinal factors in all societies that have undergone monitoring and the political choices of governments are critical. Uh, now, uh, one challenge is that the presence of gender neutral approach is the presence of gender neutral approach in the laws of some European countries, many European countries in fact, uh, particularly with regard to domestic violence. When there's gender neutral approach, this affects uh, uh, the perception that men and women are uh, equally uh, impacted by domestic violence, whereas women's disproportionate uh, experience of domestic violence is hidden from uh, view and it deflects the focus on uh, this, which is a very social structural problem. Now, another uh, gender neutrality prevents the recognition of the uh, domestic violence as a force that keeps women in subordinate position. And as you know, Istanbul Convention is based on the notion that it's gender inequality that leads to discrimination and to violence against women. So uh, that's one major uh, problem that is being faced. Another is, uh, for instance, economic violence, which is, uh, included in Article 3B of the Istanbul Convention as a form of violence is still not covered in uh, the laws of many countries or in the perception of violence in many countries. There is generally insufficient allocation of financial resources, particularly to shelters, to specialist services and to NGOs. And this is mainly because the state has, in many countries, unfortunately, have only limited commitment to combat violence against women. Um, there are many national action plans, as I said, that are being put, uh, made and put into force, but uh, oftentimes they are also project-based and therefore their sustainability is limited. And uh, what they, uh, how they deal with this holistic approach that is part and parcel of the Istanbul Convention, the four piece together, is another question. And uh, oftentimes national action plans also uh, prioritize certain forms of violence, such as physical violence. Again, it means compartmentalizing the topic, something that is not in the spirit of the Istanbul Convention, neither is it in the letter of the Istanbul Convention. 
coordinating mechanisms are weak in some countries. They're not robust enough. Their budget, their uh, resources are not there. And uh, the, these uh, often in countries, Fidelio has seen that implementation and monitoring and evaluation are done by the same bodies, which is not what, uh, what should happen uh, in, order, in order to achieve maximum effectiveness. And uh, data is a big problem, of course. With Biliana here, I don't uh, even venture into speaking about data, but inadequate data collection by public authorities is a fact. Particularly administrative data is simply not there, not only prevalence uh, statistics, but administrative data. And uh, it is not, whatever is collected is not harmonized among public bodies. And uh, it's not done on regular intervals and uh, not according to the demands that it, it should reveal information on demographic characteristics such as the age and sex of both the victim and the perpetrator, as well as the relationship between them and the geographic location, etc. Now, a femicide is quite high, of course, but there is a need to conduct systematic review of the cases uh, to identify the gaps uh, of what went wrong, what was not done before femicide occurred in the system. Uh, this is not adequately done in many countries. Judicial data is, of course, problematic. And uh, there is also very little uh, research done on the women victims of violence from vulnerable groups. Now, uh, specialized support services, although there have been improvements, I mentioned this in the improvement section too, are still very insufficient, particularly with regard to sexual offenses. Rape crisis and referral centers do not exist in many countries. Even telephone hotlines are inadequate. And uh, in some countries, mandatory mediation in civil proceedings and divorce still exists. And there are several uh, um, challenges to the implementation of the convention on the specific uh, items of uh, provisions of the convention. Now, let me sim simply say that uh, the Istanbul Convention is in a way a success story. And the reason it's being challenged and the reason it is being opposed by so many is because it, um, it really uh, has challenged the existing uh, thought patterns and the existing uh, norms of societies. And in that sense, the negative reactions that we see to this convention are perhaps uh, to be evaluated with a positive light to, uh, say, uh, to show us how well uh, results can be achieved by properly implementing the convention. And let me finish off by simply saying that immediately preceding this meeting, I just uh, participated in an African Union meeting where apparently the African Union now is uh, engaged, is starting a process in developing a, a violence against women convention, a la the Istanbul Convention, uh, for the African region, or, uh, in a, although there is the Moputo Protocol in addition to that. So, uh, you know, others are looking at the Istanbul Convention as an example, and there's a lot going on, and I am sorry for taking this long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ferdo Hocam. It was a very enlightening uh, talk. Uh, now, the second uh, panelist is Özlem. Özlem Altok is a senior lecturer in Women's and Gender Studies and International Studies at University of North Texas. As a feminist teacher scholar, she studies the an entanglement of the politics, religion, and gender. She is also a women's rights, peace, and environmental activist. She is among the many co-founders of ESHIC, the Women's Platform for Equality, Turkey, and a member of ESHIC's Equality Watch Women's Group. Özlem, floor is yours. Kind introduction. It is uh, a great honor and also a joy to speak at this meeting, not because we gather to discuss joyful 
news, but because it feels good to be in the company of feminists who share gender equality as a common value and uh, who are determined to resist the backlash against our hard-won rights. Like Fatma, I do believe that this first international meeting that we are organizing as ISHIC, as Women's Platform for Equality Turkey, is a historic event. I was asked to speak about the developments in Turkey. And in fact, the Istanbul Convention is under attack in Turkey. In July, high-ranking officials from Turkey's ruling party publicly announced that they are considering with withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention. Now, the attacks on the convention in Turkey are based entirely on misrepresentations of the treaty as undermining the family and as promoting homosexuality. Of course, the convention is not about family or about LGBTI plus or LGBTQ rights. It's about preventing violence against women and uh, domestic violence. Most of you gathered here know this. Uh, but it is worth reiterating that the two principles infuse the spirit of the text of the convention, equality and non-discrimination. Withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention and even the talk of withdrawal means undermining women's and LGBTI people's rights to live as equals, actually their right to live, period. The Turkish case is interesting, and to demonstrate how far and how fast a country can regress, I would like to briefly discuss the journey of the convention, which had not been politicized and contested, at least not at this level, um, until July of this year. Turkey was the first to sign and ratify the Istanbul Convention in May of 2011, and did so without any reservations. Every member of Turkey's parliament voted in favor of it. Justice and Development Party under Erdogan was in power then as it is now. And the convention went into effect in Turkey in 2014. So this is a bit interesting uh, story. Befitting the fact that Turkey was the first si to sign and ratify the treaty, the first chairperson of Grevio, the independent body of experts tasked with monitoring the implementation of the convention became a scholar from Turkey. Feride Ajar, who um, we just listened to. This did not happen without a good fight either. The government actually tried to put forth someone from their party as Turkey's candidate to Gravio. We resisted because the government's customary lack of consultation with women's organizations who are in the front lines of working with survivors of domestic violence went against the process by which experts to Gravio should be selected. Um, nothing happens without a good fight. Nothing good happens without a good fight in Turkey, probably not elsewhere either. In preparing for this talk, I was looking back at my emails and found Feridouja's email dated March 2nd, 2015, the day her candidacy was officially announced. In that email, she thanked us for the solidarity we showed and remarked, Probably not a single one of us will forget the solidarity of women displayed during this process. I would like to think that similarly, we will look back on today's meeting as a turning point in an unforgettable process at the end of which feminist solidarity will prevail. One of the most significant aspects of the Istanbul Convention is that it recognizes the prevention of violence against women as a responsibility of the state, the prevention as a responsibility of the state, not as a cultural or private or some other type of unfortunate phenomena, but a public and political problem that must be addressed and which thus calls for public resources and political will. This is why the Istanbul Convention is so important for us. It is not the gift of some enlightened men in suits. It is the end result of the struggles of feminists across generations who work tirelessly, skipping sleep, time to rest, time to enjoy the company of their loved ones. I know there are lots of those people among us right now. In Turkey too, since 1980s, making visible violence directed at women, which had traditionally been swept under the rug, 
has been a focus of Turkey's independent women's movement. Actually, in Turkish, we have a more graphic uh, saying. We say, kol kırılır, yen içinde kalır. I'll skip the uh, translation, something like, um, the arm may be bro broken as a, as a result of conflict or violence in the family or in a small group, but it should remain invisible in the jacket. Now, the decades-long feminist struggle to make violence against women a visible and political issue culminated in Turkey signing the Istanbul Convention in 2011. And shortly after that, the Turkish parliament passed the law to protect family and prevent violence against women, known in short as law number 6284. This built on the impetus created by the Istanbul Convention. And again, thanks to hard work of feminists. The date of its acceptance attests to the influence of uh, feminists, March 8, 2012. As fellow feminist activist and lawyer Hülya Gülbahar puts it, the Istanbul Convention, as well as law number 6284, were written with the blood of women women such as Nahida Opus and her mother and countless others. We have indeed paid a dear price to pass these laws. Overall, the Istanbul Convention, as well as Turkey's law number 6284, have fairly good provisions um, and, are, and are good um, laws, as Feridoja uh, mentioned. Unfortunately, neither the Istanbul Convention nor the national law have been implemented effectively. I'll um, skip all the problems of implementation because Ferduja touched on uh, many of them, but the lack of an emergency hotline, the problems of law enforcement dealing with survivors um, who often face discrimination um, in filing a complaint, the number of women's shelters, which are woefully insufficient, the lack of sexual violence centers that give medical and forensic evaluations, uh, little by way of housing or financial support. At least three women die every day in Turkey because gender inequality persists. In fact, violence against women as well as violence against LGBTI plus people increased quite a bit under conditions of the pandemic. So we have problems in and we have laws in Turkey, but the real problem is a political discourse that does not believe in and therefore does not work to achieve equality between men and women, much less gender equality conceived more broadly. We have known this since the 2010 meeting that uh, the then Prime Minister, current President Erdogan held with women's organizations, no less, where he declared that he does not believe in uh, equality between men and women and uh, referred to the Islamic term fitrat that refers to the different God-given nature of beings. This is important to underline because while equality between men and women may not have been achieved in practice, but the commitment to the principle of gender equality had been a hallmark of the modern Republic of Turkey. So the government's anti-egalitarian discourse blocks the effective implementation of existing laws. And our fear is that this will even get worse with statements from the top that pit the family against women's human rights. Now, things have actually gotten worse since 2016. Uh, a new commission was created in the Turkish parliament. It has, it's a mouthful, but I will read the full name, please, uh, because it gives away a lot about the commission's purpose. Parliamentary commission to investigate the factors that negatively impact the unity of the family and divorce cases and to specify the precautions needed to be taken to strengthen the institution of the family. In short, we refer to it as the divorce commission. That was their main problem. Here was a parliamentary commission that refused to listen to women's organizations at its hearings, insulted some of the most hardworking feminists and threw microphones at defenders of children's rights. 
By contrast, the commission listened to men who force and alimony laws and laws to prevent violence against women. The Divorce Commission produced a report that was quite horrific. I would like to list some of their suggestions. Um, children being married to their abusers, rapists. Encouragement of marriage of children. Mediation in settlements in cases of divorce, as well as in cases of domestic violence. And to include religious content and personnel of the Directorate of Religious Affairs in psychological support and consultation services for families. They proposed a number of administrative changes that I will skip, but that all uh, tend to amount to a total attack. This is a laundry list of issues that we have helped, had to deal with at one point or another. To give one important example, in 2016, there was a legislative proposal that would provide amnesty to sexual abusers of children. We pushed back. We mobilized the public and political parties and it was postponed. But just this summer, we got news that a very similar draft proposal had been penned, though it had not come to the floor. In both cases, those who put forth amnesty for those convicted of sexual abuse of children misrepresent their proposal as a one-time event to help those who had somehow gotten married against the laws at age 13, 14. We know what this means. Legally and politically, this opens the floodgates to early and forced marriages, not only of children, but also victims and survivors of rape who might be pressured to marry their rapists. Okay, I don't want to end on the note of um, um, all gloom and doom. So I wanted to share with you a, a few pictures of our, um, of our actions from this summer, if I may, in two minutes. Um, let me share my screen. So we've been meeting every Wednesday. Uh, this is itself a, quite an accomplishment, actually. We've been meeting every Wednesday at the same time for a half a year now. We can summarize what we've done as actions we took at the top as well as actions we took at the bottom and grassroots. We held, we sent invitations to and met with uh, almost every party except those in power um, who have not accepted our invitation um, to tell them about the issues that are dear to us and to get them to action, to get the parliament to work. Um, so these are some of those pictures. Women organized um, and we wrote Istanbul Convention saves lives in every part of the country. These are pictures from many different cities and the one on the right is from the top of Uludağ mountain. From the beaches to the streets. The image on the left, I, I see that we have some people from Spain. Um, and this is actually a reference, the hands, the purple hands to uh, Ni Una Menos, Not One Woman Less movement, which started, of course, in Argentina. Um, and then we also worked with local government, municipalities, and we, as a women's platform for equality, are responsible for raising such awareness about Istanbul Convention, putting our slogans um, on billboards, and to what you see on the right to um, municipal buildings. And we didn't stop within the borders of Turkey. You see here some world cities. And uh, I would like to say that this one um, made by one of our uh, Women's Platform for Equality uh, member organizations, Eşitiz, reads, if Istanbul Convention was implemented, they would be living Thing. And the background to Punar Gültekin's picture is um, the faces of women who have been murdered. So I would like to end by saying that it, uh, saying it clearly, <laughs> that um, the single most vigilant, organized, and active opposition in Turkey today to the authoritarianism of this government is the women's movement, and I'm proud to be a part of it. And I would like to see what we can do together across borders. Uh, and we do have a suggestion of at least producing a common statement after this meeting. And maybe we can talk about that during the second part. Thank you so much for listening.
bio of Rada Boric. Rada Boric is a feminist scholar and peace activist, an active member of women's movement in Croatia, the region, and internationally. She is a regional coordinator for the V-Day and one billion rising global campaign against violence against women and girls. She was a member of the executive board and vice president of European Women's Lobby and was the member of the Noble uh, uh, Women's Initiative St Steering Committee and is currently a member of the Mediterranean Women's Mediators Network. Rada Boric is a member of the city assembly of uh, the city of Zagreb and since July 2020, a member of the Croatian parliament, new left party, Green Left Coalition. Rada, floor is yours. Your time Hello. is 12 minutes. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I wouldn't start gloomy. I would just tell you, since, since I'm a novice in Croatian Parliament, why an old feminist decided to run to the Parliament. Because in the last 10 years, we didn't have simply anyone even to pass any hour amendment to improve women's rights in Croatia. So somebody had <laughs> to do it. And little bit to boast, it's not longer than seven weeks that I'm in a parliament. And I think I did a little miracle as also our gathering is today. On the 23rd of September, for the first time ever in our parliament, everyone stood up because I demanded, it was a national day against violence against women a day before, that everyone stood up for killed women in Croatia, because femicide is everywhere, um, is horrible, and it's every year more and more women. You could believe that they didn't like me when I did it, that I should have informed them in advance, you know, we're supposed to get up for, you know, military, um, men who has been accused for crimes uh, during the wars on the Balkans in The Hague, then they stand up for the minute of silence. So my minute of silence, I think, really proved it was, it was good to be in a parliament. And in a seven weeks already, it's just today, we had a plenary session. Our ombudsperson on children's rights was there and she was attacked by a right wing of the you know pedophilia that you know they are promoting by gender <laughs> equality and so forth and so forth at least there are now seven of us to defend to defend human rights and women's rights in the parliament so just to maybe inspire some of you when you would be tired of of being an activist uh, but still all uh, seven of us we are telling that we are with one our with a f one foot on the street and of course, one foot in a parliament. This is why I think we want a seat because for us politics it is a politics from, from, from down being with the people. And I think that that's something, let's say, to inspire you. I'll go back. Thanks, Feride, and 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 thanks, Oslem, because basically you gave us a framework how how it went with the ratification. It's almost similar, I think, in the Balkans, but that tells something how we did it. So might be the, what you ask us to tell a minute of two for the end, why it is important that we are in connection and that we are in solidarity. Croatia, um, um, in fact, um, uh, before the ratification that in Croatia happened in 2018, in 2013, 27 organizations in the region, a region means former Yugoslavia, the uh, women's organization start promoting um, ratification of the convention with a huge campaign called I Sign. And I think it took us really five years that, and of course we promote it in a different uh, other ways, but I think it was crucial that it was a regional, a regional campaign and all of the countries, but, but Croatia and Macedonia, even Macedonia signed it a little bit earlier, already signed it in 2016. 
Croatia had a chance to sign it that year and had even so-called uh, whatever left government, social democrats in power and didn't do it because many times, unfortunately, either leftists do not recognize that many of the battles are done over our bodies. And this is now we have in Croatia the same case with the, the new law on the right to abortion that you know social democrats didn't want in parliament it is very parliament to have a president of the board for the gender equality because it's for them less important than, than some other boards what we did we really campaigned but in this 2016 the government changed and the nationalistic and often with a very many wings of right wing wings and a fascist wings won but since they promised to ratify to European Union, we were a new member from 2013 and as a good pupil, uh, pupils who waited for a long in a waiting room of Europe, they want to satisfy uh, Europe. So, of course, they had to ratify a convention, otherwise they wouldn't so willingly do it. And immediately, if I tell you that almost on Istanbul Convention, that the the, the leading ruling party, Croatian ruling party from the 90s, uh, almost split in two. Because part with the prime minister, who is a Brussels pupil, wanted to ratify, and the right wing immediately started attacking it, and of course attacking it uh, liably with telling that the Istanbul Convention uh, is going to, to put uh, gender equality, that there would be bearded men in dresses going into women's uh, bathrooms and so forth. You all know the story. What had happened, that then found in Parliament a commission, a side of parliamentarians, they invited to have the equality, they invited two people from, let's say, feminist side and two people from already a right-wing uh, movement. And as you know, in Europe, and especially colleagues from Poland, my say, and, and Hungary and Bulgaria, it is an imported um, uh, right-wing movement from extra, I would say, uh, movement from the states, like Ordo Juris and different groups that, of course, are talking about the danger of gender equality. They had money, they started a horribly huge campaign uh, uh, supported by a Catholic church with thousands of people on the street with huge banners, jumbo posters on which there would be, let's say, a picture of a little girl and they would tell, um, um, they are teaching me, a girl is speaking, they are teaching me in school to decide whether I'm a girl or a boy. The only thing to fight against such a liable thing was, I addressed our Ministry of Education, you have some law on information that they have to, to write you back, and I asked to get transcripts, and even of, uh, transcripts of the phones or complaints, if any parents complain, made a complaint. And I got in two weeks an answer that there was not a single one. So, and they, of course, their movement, they called the truth on Istanbul Convention. And this is what the truth was. And we have to disguise, of course, we had to demantle, you know, all supposedly the truth. What they did so that we ratify a convention, they did that many other countries also did. They made a, a kind of introductory note called interpolation. And in this, inter, uh, they in fact uh, call it interpretative note of a government. And they said there is no need to introduce gender in ideology in Croatian judicial and educational system, another change of the Croatian definition of marriage in our constitution. So they kind of make a huge bracket that this Istanbul Convention wouldn't be. And eventually, since this is not obligatory, this is, I would just say, a kind of excuse or to smoothen the ratification, to shut up the right wing, they made this 
kind of interpretative note or something. But if you see what was bugging right wing, you could see exactly there. There was introduction in judicial system and in education, gender ideology, and of course the definition of family, because right wing managed a year earlier with a huge protest and a referendum to change in our constitution the definition of marriage. We had never, you know, I don't think that any constitution should have definition of marriage, but it, now we have a definition that marriage is only between a woman and a man, and you can bet how many problems then LGBTIQ plus community has with ed, any other things, including, let's say, adoption of, of children. So, of course, immediately when it happened, so it had immediately a backlash on it and very low implementation about which we have heard. So, of course, not only that we do not know and that there is no monitoring of what's going on, but the main things we fought for around financial uh, issues and around services, this yet two years later, it's not done. It means that we demanded, you know, that, that in convention there is, depending on the number of, of population, how many, let's say, shelters for bettered women you do have. So this yet is not done. Croatia is dividing into uh, regions and basically uh, several regions still do not have services. Still what we have and we always has been fighting is that several um, shelters are run by NGOs, by, by feminist organizations. And we still want to have them because this few that we have by a state have their other criteria how do they support women compared to how feminist women support women. The other good thing, the rare good thing what had happened, and this is what Ferija talked, is that there are some improvements into legal area and one that is really good. We managed to change, we had in our criminal code, the difference between uh, sexual intercourse with consent, without consent, this is how it was defined, and rape. And for women, what is it sexual intercourse without consent than that rape? And we managed really to change it. Although right-wing lawyers from University of Law were against, but this is about, I would say, a feminist movement and, and possibility of women to change things. Um, I prepared some slides. I don't know, I talk fastly, but I still think I used already my time. I prepared some uh, slides. If somebody can show it, I send it to you just to see that, of course, the right wing uh, being supported by, as I said, primarily by church. They have been by buses bringing, let's say, to Zagreb to protests. We could see that people were not from Zagreb uh, who were against. Um, but of course, for us, I think the biggest thing is when you have a rolling of a snowball, when women, you know, from the 90s, when since we changed our system from socialist country uh, to, toward neoliberal, who knows what, peripheral uh, little uh, country, uh, we have been really trying for the, uh, to save 8th of March. So 8th of March, from the 90s, they started as a small ge gathering of feminists, turned now last few years into huge women's night marches that uh, every year has a topic. And uh, last few years, it is on women's uh, reproductive and sexual rights. And it's more and more people coming. And because between Istanbul Convention, we had a huge movement called if you translate it, it's not, for me, it's not a feminist title, but gather 20,000 women, so it's better, you know, whatever title is, it was called like Save Me. And it was 20,000 women and men came to, to protest on uh, against violence against women. Uh, since I would say that community in Croatia, after 30 years of really work of feminists, do understand what is violent, so what it does to women, also what new forms of violence are doing to women, 
also now during the pandemic, what does it mean for women that we have to talk that already in Europe, there are research that says that 60% of women more are violated during the pandemic, or not only violated, but that the may affect that not only that they are enclosed, but this that women are taking more job at home, more working with kids online, more deprived for economic, for economic their own freedoms, and more pressure to women, I think that we are going to face radically difficult times in many senses, especially economic rights on women. And you know, without economic p power, how women uh, can uh, leave the, the violent environment partner or, or a husband. For, I think why it's good that we are together, I think it's also a new time for a different type of solidarity among us. I think that sometimes, and I remember this in the midst of 90s, how for us meant that women who were parliamentary women from Europe could speak. You know, they didn't know that, that at least let's say if I would come to Turkey, they wouldn't know that I'm not so respected back home. But the minute that you are a parliamentary member and that you speak gives us a little bit more power. And I think this is maybe our chance to see pro and cons that happen. What is going on with the backlash? What's the next step that we can that we can expect? Because if you think that right wing movements really stole our, I would say uh, they didn't steal our agendas, but they stole our techniques. They really start being organized as we are. They are using our methods of of struggle. They are using you know protests. Uh, they are not so creative as we are, but still I think we have to predict not always to to react uh, what they do, predict what might, might have happened and how to prevent it and how to creatively organize a, a better and safer place for women. Thank you, Rada. I didn't want to cut you really. I mean, you are, uh, it was a great speech. We did something that really, I wouldn't say scared, but you know that you have to have a content that media loves. We had yeah. handmaids. We made like uh, uh, 60 gowns, you know, this, uh, this famous serial handmaids of this mm -hmm. utop mm -hmm. utopian uh, Atwood's book. So when, when women are living in the world, when they are just the containers for giving babies, and this is really scary. If somebody hasn't seen it, you should. And, and we all were dressed up in these red um, dresses with uh, caps, looking down, not seeing. And we were marching through a city with women dressed, uh, having drums, you know, and drumming on the street, like that they are taking us to, to, to guillotine. And it was really powerful. You, oh, we yes. have to have a creative things that really touches emotions. But this mm -hmm. you can maybe send and share if somebody is interested on maybe next time we just talk about how creative initiatives we can have in our struggle. Because sometimes you know even us that we are bored with our own 12 steps how to overcome violence leaflets and that you know people are taking and throwing away how more creative we could be to um, to attract more women into our movements. Yes, you're right completely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Genova Vetisheva was a member of the UN CEDO Committee for Bulgaria between 2019 and 2022. She is the chair of the working group on uh, gender-based violence against women and the managing director of Bulgarian Research, Bulgarian Gender Research Foundation, and also chair of the Alliance for Protection from Gender-Based Violence. Genova is a lawyer, researcher, and advocate. She's an expert in the field of gender equality and women's rights, and has extensive experience in le legal reform, having participated in drafting the Bulgarian law for protection against domestic violence. Genoveva Tisheva is a member of the European Network of Legal Experts in Gender Equality and Non-Discrimination and until 2019 
Vice Chair of the European Women's Lawyers Association, uh, Women's Lawyer Association, EWLA. She received the Special Human Rights Defenders Award of the Advocates for Human Rights from Minnesota in 2017. Genova, floor is yours. Your time is 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gongshu. Uh, I am very thankful to um, your platform, to the esteemed colleagues uh, that already spoke, to, uh, to Rada, uh, to Oslem, uh, and uh, I am really thrilled to participate in this conference. Uh, I will present the situation of Bulgaria because I was asked to speak about Bulgaria specifically. So to say that Bulgarian society, although uh, a Bulgarian member of the EU and the European community as a whole, has a deeply rooted notion of gender difference where there are still traditional gender roles without a real sense of gender inequality and sense of the prevalence of violence and abuse against women and girls. Uh, many women are silenced by social and cultural norms and endure violence and cruelty in their homes in the last two years, over 60 women died, about 40 in 2018 alone, at the hand of their intimate partners or relatives. But the protests and declarations against these cases of femicide were silenced and were not taken into consideration to the extent needed by the government. Uh, the need for better protection of women from violence by more effective international standards, including the Istanbul Convention, was distorted and compromised by certain conservative circles, even openly by persons in positions of power in Bulgaria. And we know that from the beginning of this year and with the pandemic, uh, we witnessed through the media publications already about 20 cases of severe murders of women by their partners in Bulgaria. And this all happened and is happening in the context of fierce opposition of the circles I mentioned, political, religious, media circles and social media, to the issue of violence against women and to the ratification of the Istanbul Convention in Bulgaria. We are champions, as you know, in this field. Uh, the term gender and related notions of gender equality and gender-based violence were rejected, distorted and debased by these political and ideological circles. And at the same time, Bulgaria uh, uh, still lacked adequate support services for victims uh, according to the um, Council of Europe recommendations and standards, so for uh, safe accommodation in specialized uh, crisis centers and shelters. But what we are really uh, first in the negative, actually the most advanced in the negative reaction is that by the end of July 2018, the Constitutional Court in Bulgaria ruled with a preliminary ruling on constitutionality um, ruled that the Istanbul Convention is unconstitutional as a whole in its integrity. And it was done by simple majority of the votes of the judges. And uh, that the, uh, they say that the convention was not in compliance with the Bulgarian constitution for reasons of going against the principle of legal certainty, imagine. Although not being a convincing ruling, uh, and not fully in compliance with the constitution itself, this decision had a very damaging effect on the whole theme of gender equality and for the fight against violence against women in Bulgaria. So the ruling was clearly politically influenced and its arguments are weak and not justified by the constitution itself, as I said, and by normal international law and other uh, laws in, in the country. Uh, the, the principle of legal certainty, uh, as applied in the formal sense, uh, is applied incorrectly, was applied incorrectly in the arguments of the Constitution Constitutional Court. First of all, this principle has two elements, and the most important element is the legal certainty for protection of rights of citizens. Instead of that, the court just overlooked that, this first element, and looked at the second element, the principle, uh, of the formal uh, element of strict legal certainty, strict legal certainty in terms of notions and terms, and forgot absolutely about the protection of citizens. So uh, we also think that the, the deliberation around the term gender 
are not based on any legal ground. The extension of gender to gender ideology is completely arbitrary by the Constitutional Court. But anyway, we have, uh, as you know, this, um, this uh, Constitutional Court ruling as a barrier in Bulgaria. Uh, I would like to say that despite the unfortunate, unfortunate process around the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, Bulgarian uh, women's NGOs continue to provide support. They are the only ones really uh, providing support to victims of violence, women and girls. And not only, but at the end of 2018, and with the support um, of uh, different coalitions like the Alliance for Protection from Gender-Based Violence, the government and parliament initiated amendments in the penal code because there was pressure uh, providing for increase uh, strength and penal protection from domestic violence with qualifying and aggravating circumstances and with increased penalties. It was the influence of, of course, the Istanbul Convention that we have just signed but not ratified. But anyway, there were changes, but I, uh, I, will, I would mention just the, the negative, let's say, the negative result of these changes. Um, according to some definitions in the criminal code, after the adoption of, the, let's say, positive changes, uh, the, a crime is considered committed in conditions of domestic violence if it is preceded by systematic physical, sexual, or psychological violence placing the person in economic dependence, coercive restriction of personal life, personal liberty, and personal rights. So the term systemic, systematic in the criminal code requires victims to document three prior instances of violence by the same perpetrator in order for a public prosecution or exofficio prosecution to be opened against the abuser. So it, we think that it's very difficult to, uh, to achieve this protection through the, the criminal uh, code now, despite the fact that it's already enforced. And that's why, uh, based on that, we had proposals from NGOs and also by the ombudsperson in Bulgaria, she supported uh, these amendments, but finally also the Ministry of Justice, that in a special uh, amendment of the law on protection from domestic violence, plus uh, it, it is included uh, that there will be amendments also of the criminal code, exactly uh, in the direction of excluding this, um, the requirement for systematic. I, we think it's very important. It's just a draft. It's just a draft, I will say, but it's important. But in addition to that, uh, also recognition of uh, um, actually I'm punishing uh, punishment for marital rape, which is important. This is just a draft, but I think all, also in direction of uh, compliance, let's say, with standards, international standards, but also standards of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, together with that, we managed to, um, uh, to work with the Ministry of Justice in a working group because we uh, also pushed very much for this for the last year and a half to produce this draft, as I said, for amendment of the law and protection from domestic violence, including many, many advanced solutions of the Istanbul Convention, like uh, absolutely excluding mediation, protection of children in parallel of, of the protection of victims, also um, creating a commission uh, at the level of the Council of Ministers. This is also provided. Uh, also decided about financing of NGOs, uh, enhancing the role of NGOs in many instances, and also the services. It's important that a, a whole chapter on specialized services for domestic violence, for also other forms of violence against women, and for protecting of children, uh, also witnesses and victims of violence, is also very important that it was included. So, so this is the good news that there is a draft. The draft is in the Ministry of Justice. They were prepared to uh, send it for consultations and then for uh, um, for passing, let's say, in the um, in parliament. The bad news is that first during this pandemic, all this process is also on the working group, and it was very difficult process to achieve this draft together with our colleagues from the alliance and other um, other NGOs supporting it, and. Uh, a second, we don't think it's at the very right moment. First, it's in the middle of, you know, protest in Bulgaria against the government, against corruption, um, for the rule of law, very important protest. Then reaction, which is very conservative by the government, both to the protest, but to all that kind of um, new 
uh, proposals and we are afraid that if this law now goes to the parliament actually um, it will be a crash and this is something that is uh, prepared with lots of efforts in this direction i mean for the um, implementation of the international standards that i mentioned for changing the provision about requirement for systematic um, domestic violence uh, go also the um, recommendations of the CEDAW committee that were actually uh, announced by the end of in the beginning of March this year so Bulgaria passed uh, was reviewed by the committee but also uh, the, um, the report and the recommendations of the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women is Causes and Consequences. Uh, she, uh, Mrs. Dubravka Shimonovic, she visited the country in 2019. So these are the positive, actually, things that the positive moments and things seeds for future changes in the direction, not if not of the ratification, but the implementation of the Istanbul Convention. And also these recommendations of the Special Rapporteur and of the CEDAW Committee despite uh, the denial of the government, despite the fact that they refuse to review and they don't think uh, this decision of the Constitutional Court can be reviewed, goes in the direction of recommending to the country to ratify, after all, the Istanbul Convention. So we are also going to the political now because it's all political and in the middle of pandemic, we also have pre-election period anyway, this spring normally they would be elections so it means that all this ideology um, damaging to, to women's rights damaging to the cause of protection of women will be spread and it it is there already it is popping up again all these attitudes against the convention against the women's ngos against the ngos in general like in the other countries like in your countries in bulgaria it is the same and we are also afraid you understand for the cause of this law that we want to change and we want to change also some provisions in the criminal law in su at such a moment. What is also would like to say political moment, important moment that there is a, a resolution, uh, you know, maybe from 8th of uh, October this year, um, where uh, they voted, the, the European Parliament voted the resolution to approve, to approve it and harshly criticize Bulgaria on rule of law issues. And among the issues Bulgaria is criticized about, and this is also, let's say, positive for us and a good cause for work, uh, is uh, that it expresses regret to Bulgaria's failure to ratify the Istanbul Convention, and it and this and in the framework of really uh, having really a very bad record and statistic, statistic on violence against women, and very uh, within ineffective protection uh, of victims of violence both by uh, criminal law and civil law. Uh, so we think that it will give us force along with the other unresolved systematic issues of the judiciary, uh, corruption, accountability and control. Um, so um, uh, our other concern uh, here is that uh, there will not be a uh, good moment for implementation of the recommendations of the CEDAW committee. There is, this is never a good moment after the pandemic, but we, we have to find a way to, to reiterate what the CEDAW committee recommends to Bulgaria, what the special rapporteur. Um, and uh, what we have uh, in this uh, pre-election period, we have fears, um, we have to combat sexism and misogyny because it is at every occasion and at every level, it is manifested because it, it comes with the political fight, as you know. And the example of um, attacking women in power and attacking women during elections. Uh, I think it's uh, also uh, affecting all women that are silenced, all women that are in violence, that are discriminated against. So um, we very, very much, we also, we, the civil society will uh, be occupied with that. Uh, what uh, I would like to say that we have this backlash uh, concerning a draft of a new constitution. Suddenly, two months ago, they started speaking the government about the new constitution they would introduce, um, uh, you know, in parliament, that they were ready with the new constitution. And this new constitution contains uh, re uh, requirements for uh, recognizing, as you all said, uh, the specific, um, let's say, the specific 
um, characteristics of, of the family, as you said, um, uh, by a man and a woman, uh, mixing family and marriage, uh, you know, marriage between men and women, it's like family between a man and a woman, and uh, all, all these um, issues of pat patriarchal um, stereotypes and uh, confining women to traditional role, again, against combating stereotypes it will come up if they will consider this um, this new draft. And uh, in order to support uh, ourselves in our fights and also to the fight of Bulgarian women and organizations, we had some proposals um, for you to consider uh, together with this coalition that we are going to form, uh, that our uh, organizations want to have exchange of good practices, uh, common public action and support of public action, um, also exchange of uh, experts, hosts between the countries uh, to speak about the, the issues that are at stake, but we see that in all our countries we have the same issues at stake, but to exchange and uh, maybe joint monitoring reports and common projects in the, uh, to try to have in the region and in all affected affected countries, we are one region from that point of view. I, ideology made us also <laughs> additionally one region and to work together for cooperation within this coalition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Genova. You can hear the timing is uh, perfect. <laughs> I have problem with camera. Oh, you have problem with camera? I say hello to everyone, and I'm sorry that I could join uh, so late uh, on it. I'm, if I'm not the last one, uh, so I would no. appreciate you to give me a more chance uh, to listen to others and then uh, to speak a bit later. Is that okay? Oh, it's okay. Okay, then uh, you can talk after. Uh, I, I think the Reka is the, the, the next speaker. Okay, uh, maybe you can fix your camera problem. Yeah, I will try. Then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist uh, will be... Just a second. Reka Safrani. Uh, before that, uh, I would like to say hello and welcome to Yakun Hoca and uh, Önay Alpago. Uh, Turkish prominent women are with us. I'm sure there are a lot of prominent women with us. Uh, thanks for coming and joining us today. Now our next speaker will be... Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, has, uh, from Hungary, Reka Safrani has been working as a gender specialist at Hungarian women's rights NGOs since 2004. She is the chair of the Hungarian Women's Lobby and member of the Board of European Women's Lobby. She has experience in conducting research and writing policy analysis on the following topics, women's political participation, gender and the media, and the policy responses to violence against women. She holds a, a Master of Arts degree in Gender Studies from Central European University, Budapest, and Master of Doug, uh, Art Degrees in English and German Literature and Linguistics from ERTA University, Budapest. Reka, floor is yours. Could you please unmute and open your video? Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, I have to say it is very uplifting to be among uh, like-minded uh, feminists, uh, esteemed colleagues from uh, all over Europe uh, and uh, including from Hungary. Thank you very much. I would like to say that there are a lot of similarities that have uh, uh, emerged, I think, from uh, the previous uh, speakers' points. Uh, for example, of course, uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, experiences have been quite similar and the surge in uh, violence against women uh, has been observed, unfortunately. Also, there is a, a kind of cross-pollination among uh, uh, conservative governments uh, with regard to uh, how they relate to uh, the Istanbul Convention. And I think uh, the uh, Hungarian government has also uh, 
uh, done a few moves that have been um, inspiring or have been copied, uh, unfortunately, in other uh, countries as well. The uh, political situation uh, since uh, 2010 has been quite similar in Hungary because uh, we that was when the conservative uh, government uh, came into power. Uh, and uh, this coincides, of course, uh, with, uh, with the Istanbul Convention. And we can see that uh, the political uh, um, kind of direction in, in the, uh, regarding women's rights and gender equality has uh, been regressive since then. And uh, their um, motto has been that in, instead of uh, gender equality or gender mainstreaming, they promote family mainstreaming, of course, uh, according to heteronormative uh, concepts. So these main directions haven't changed, uh, although some modifications uh, are, are uh, somewhat um, uh, visible. But regarding the Istanbul Convention, I will give you a brief timeline of what has happened. Uh, in 2013, uh, a government a working group was established uh, to prepare the accession uh, to the convention, but uh, women's rights organizations were not invited to this, uh, and we uh, actually didn't get information on the, on the nature and the outcome of their work. Uh, but uh, suddenly, <laughs> it, just before the uh, national elections in uh, 2014, uh, the convention was uh, signed. Uh, by the parliament and the government and in February until February 2017 uh, there was a kind of phase where we had uh, very little information about uh, what was going on to promote uh, the ratification and uh, there was no uh, official news what what we uh, sometimes um, uh, could gather in uh, the information from the ministries was that they had to coordinate among them, uh, look at legislation uh, and resources, especially. But in 2017, in February, uh, all of a sudden, a, a draft uh, uh, law on the ratification of the convention was opened up for public consultation uh, altogether for nine days. And uh, this gave, of course, uh, uh, an important um, occasion or opportunity for us uh, to speak up uh, for, the, for the convention. But of course, uh, anybody, uh, and uh, including uh, conservative forces, could make their voices heard. After this moment, the legislative process stopped altogether. That was what, that was what we uh, could observe. And from the second half of uh, 2017, state uh, stakeholders and uh, uh, prominent figures from the leading Fidesz party uh, were more and more outspoken against uh, the Istanbul Convention. So uh, their main problem was uh, related to the uh, concept of gender mentioned and the gender equality as a concept uh, that is used in the Istanbul Convention and also uh, more and more uh, in the context uh, in the context of uh, the anti-migration approach that our government had, uh, this was uh, connected with uh, with the Istanbul Convention, and uh, they said they uh, what what we could uh, see was that uh, they are moving more and more into the direction of uh, rejecting it on the basis of these two main points. Uh, seeing this. Uh, NGOs, members of our uh, umbrella, uh, have initiated uh, a petition, an, an, an open letter to the government, uh, saying that uh, th these claims are based on a misinterpretation of uh, the concept of gender and gender equality uh, in, the, uh, in the convention. And we had a lot of support from uh, like-minded uh, colleagues, NGOs, and uh, all together almost uh, 7,000 people uh, signed this petition. But we didn't, uh, and, and the, the other um, attached um, piece of document we provided with this petition was a list of the women killed in Hungary 
since uh, in the uh, in domestic violence uh, since the signing of the, uh, of uh, the sorry of the convention uh, and since it wasn't re ratified but we got no response no official response to that in um, in the summer of uh, 2019 we got a new Minister of Justice, uh, a female minister, uh, Judith Varga, uh, who um, in the candidate's hearing uh, labeled the issue surrounding the Istanbul Convention as a political issue, as a political hysteria, actually. And uh, her um, stance towards the Istanbul Convention was uh, uh, and has been uh, uh, very negative uh, altogether. Uh, she, uh, as you said, that it, the, the convention itself is quite a powerful tool. It can be seen uh, from exactly the backlash, the, the force of the backlash uh, that it is getting. Uh, interestingly, as a member of the government, she uses it uh, as a kind of standard. Uh, she uh, has made a comparison uh, even in the EU that she is using in the EU context between uh, the Hungarian legal provision and what the uh, Istanbul Convention calls for. Uh, we think that uh, this uh, comparison is uh, um, showing that the Hungarian legisla legislative framework is uh, lacking uh, in the holistic and gender sensitive approach uh, that the Istanbul Convention is promoting. The lack of uh, the gender sensitive approach, even in uh, a few uh, improvements that have uh, happened uh, in the legislative uh, way, uh, means that, um, of course, uh, women's and uh, uh, victims' uh, rights are not centered, not, not in the focus so much. And uh, as you mentioned, that there is a mediation in, term, in, in uh, the cases of uh, divorce, for example, and child uh, uh, custody settlements and so on, this can be seen in, in Hungary uh, as well. So uh, recently there have, there have been uh, new developments uh, because in the media uh, uh, there were some uh, suddenly, uh, we heard of some very horrific uh, cases of uh, uh, domestic violence against women and against children. And uh, the, uh, our, our minister uh, uh, trying to, to react to this, uh, these cases which really uh, affected the public perception uh, about domestic violence uh, has convened a family law expert group in February of 2020. Uh, in this uh, expert group, they haven't, or they didn't include any NGOs, but for NGOs, they have a separate uh, um, kind of task force. And uh, uh, we uh, observed that, that although there is a thematic working group on women's rights, the members of this group were not automatically invited into this group, for example. Uh, Mm, so we we had to uh, lobby for for invitation, for example, into the group. And um, although this um, uh, group or, or membership in this group uh, has made has uh, made it possible for us to um, speak up and, and uh, uh, tell the minister about and the and the governmental. Uh, uh, people there to get, tell us about, uh, tell them about experience uh, related to women's needs and uh, uh, women's real experience of uh, uh, domestic violence. Um, the, the outcomes have not been um, very satisfactory, we would say. And also among the members of the NGOs, there are uh, very, there are more, actually more uh, father's rights and men's rights organizations uh, than, than women's rights organizations. And uh, among, these, among these men, uh, there are some who have been um, convicted of crimes related to domestic violence and violence against children. So 
uh, often times uh, we have the impression uh, that uh, they try to set us um, set women's women's rights organizations and and these uh, fathers rights uh, NGOs uh, uh, as a kind of uh, um, into like a like a balance into <laughs> as if as if uh, it's a uh, mattered to the same extent what they experience and what uh, uh, um, and what we uh, what we think about the issue and what our experiences are ignoring the fact that the istanbul convention itself clearly states uh, women's um, uh, women are more affected and uh, in in a very gendered sort of way uh, by violence uh, in the family uh, so we find uh, this juxtaposition uh, very, very problematic. Um, we made, of course, written submissions uh, to these uh, expert um, to this expert group, uh, but uh, we will see. Actually, uh, we will see what will come out of it. Uh, a very, very important uh, development has been that in 2020, uh, during the lockdown in May. Uh, the Hungarian parliament adopted a political declaration on the importance of protecting children and women, as well as on the rejection of accession to the Istanbul Convention. Uh, they did this uh, in a situation where when uh, women's NGOs and no other NGOs could go out in the streets and, and uh, protest, because at the same time, uh, it was uh, very, very limited uh, who could uh, protest under what circumstances. So uh, mm, this, uh, the, the actual case with this, with this um, political declaration is that it doesn't only reject uh, the um, uh, ratification of the convention within uh, Hungary, within uh, the national government, but it also promotes the rejection by the EU. So it actively uh, tries to, to veto, to stop uh, uh, that process. Uh, so what to say in a situation like this, what, would, what, can be, uh, uh, what can we suggest for, uh, for joint action in our group? Uh, we would say that uh, we have been thinking about it, my colleagues and I, and we think that it's very important to uh, give more room for such events as this one to harmonize, uh, to to share our knowledge and experiences um, at the international level, because we often see that this uh, um, tendency to copy and paste <laughs> the, these uh, these uh, governmental approaches uh, can have a very quick harmful effect. For example, in relation between Hungary and Poland, we have we have seen this. Um, uh, we would like to suggest that uh, international uh, umbrella organizations such as the European Women's Lobby, uh, which is more about uh, the promotion of women's rights, uh, and the WAVE uh, Europe, which is more about service provision, uh, that uh, they, as structures and as sources of knowledge, uh, should be should be used, and uh, we should cooperate with them. Um, so, positive examples are also very uh, important to mention. Uh, so, uh, what we heard in the beginning uh, by uh, the professor was that uh, these these positive examples. Uh, uh, are, are very inspiring, motivating, and uh, show the, the validity of the holistic approach uh, of the convention. Um, but, um, so we, these are the main uh, things that uh, we would, at this point, uh, find uh, motivating. In, in Hungary, I would like to say that, uh, not to be all gloomy about the picture, what we have seen is uh, that the societal support for the Istanbul Convention and uh, mm, the, the mm, kind of protest against uh, uh, 
the victim blaming approach uh, uh, that uh, we can often see in, me in the media uh, and the judiciary and so on. Uh, this has, this has uh, grown tremendously. So the, the move by the government and the parliament to reject the ratification has been met by uh, a lot of uh, supporters of the Istanbul Convention to speak out and uh, stick to it um, and give, give their support to the, to the victims. These are tremendously important uh, to find ways of uh, coalition and making coalitions with existing and, and uh, uh, new um, forces and new coalitions to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, in fact, uh, we can see that there are a lot of resemblance uh, between two countries, between, I mean, uh, all countries, I believe. Uh, so uh, I would like to say thank you again. Uh, I'm sure that we will find a way to struggle together. Uh, now our next speaker uh, will be from Poland, Ursula. Can you hear me? Did, did you fix the uh, video problem? Uh, Ursula Nowakowska is a lawyer and feminist, founder and head of the Women's Rights Center to, uh, to counter violence against women and promote gender equality. She is also the co-founder of the Women's Against Violence Europe organization, WAVE. I think the WAVE organization's president, Pili, is with us. Pili, hi to you. Welcome. Uh, it's nice to see you uh, with us. Thank you for joining, really. Uh, if we can have Ursula in, a, in one or three, two minutes, we can continue. If not, I will go to the open forum part of the meeting. We will continue with the open forum session with, in the open forum. Uh, EFSA Kroner will be our moderator. Let me say a few words about EFSA. EFSA Kroner went to school and university in the United Kingdom where she received her BA in history and philosophy from University of East Ang Anglia. She has been a women's rights activist since 1999 after a short spot work, uh, working in the fashion in the industry in Turkey. She was closely involved with two local NGOs, Ana Kültür and Women for, Women for Women's Human Rights, New Ways. Before joining Eşitiz Equality Watch, Women's Group, where she is, is their volunteer and social media coordinator. Efsa, I'm giving the floor to you uh, and to, thanks to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma, and thank you to all the participants, to Feride Hoca, Özlem, Rada, Genoveva, and Reka for your uh, inspiring uh, presentations. Um, I think our problems seem to be similar. We have similar strains in all of our countries, in the whole region, from what I've heard from what you all said. And uh, the important thing is to be in solidarity, to keep in touch and to come up with some common ground where we can um, protest together, work together, uh, lobby our parliaments together, whichever uh, the one minute silence was a great idea, Rekas, um, the Croatian women, maybe we can all emulate that in our own countries. Um, thank you for all the great ideas. And now um, I open the floor to anyone who can wants to comment on everything that's been said to come up with um, common ground we can all work on, solutions, suggestions. Ute Gerhard, yes, we listen. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I, I was very impressed by your presentations. And uh, uh, I was a professor of gender studies at the University of Frankfurt. And now I'm emerita. <laughs> but I learned a lot now. And I think the common ground for all these regressive uh, developments is that besides a conservative uh, 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 regressive stay, there is the, um, the, the, the attempt 
to substitute gender or, or women by family. Uh, in, in Germany, it was a big step when we, when we uh, uh, succeeded in a law that uh, uh, brought in that rape in marriage is also a violence of women. So, because ra uh, marriage always was the one uh, cell where everything could be done. So, this law in 1997 that made clear that rape in marriage is not allowed, is a violence also. This was the, 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 the decisive step, I think. So, and now in your different countries, as I learned, um, family again is the issue and not women. Then well, really this is a misunderstanding of the, of the uh, convention at all, because it is necessary to know that family just ma makes the ground for, for violence as we know. And so we have to, to be, uh, refer to the individuals in family and not the family as an institution that uh, uh, is a private room where, no, room where no, nobody might in, inter, inter, uh, go into. Yes. So I think this, this is a common development of uh, regressive steps that is done here in these uh, uh, countries we heard about. Thank you. Thank you, Uteyes. You're absolutely right. Uh, that's exactly what's happening here as well. And rape is a crime under our civil code at the moment, mm -hmm. so far, uh, which was um, thanks to the women's movement pushing for it. But thank you for your input, and I think Ursula is back. Yes. Okay, so I will. I'm sorry uh, for being late, and I'm sorry for all this uh, inconvenience and uh, problems with uh, me and uh, my camera. Uh, I'm very happy to join the meeting and uh, share with you some information about the development in Poland. Uh, probably many of you. Uh, know quite well what is going on in Poland because we are very often on the first pages on varying, uh, various foreign uh, magazines and, and TV because of the uh, situation we are facing uh, in Poland. So let me start with the uh, uh, convention. So Poland was uh, one of the first, <laughs> I think, to sign the convention. It was uh, in 2012. Uh, although at that time also we have a very uh, hard debates and discussion in the uh, parliament and many of the uh, present opposition uh, parties um, were also uh, members of this opposition, uh, now opposition parties at that time, governing parties, were not so happy to, uh, to sign the convention, but finally uh, we succeeded and that was a quite a, a strong support of women's rights organizations uh, uh, for, the, for signing a convention. Uh, but uh, the time for the ratification uh, was quite quite long. Uh, finally, uh, Poland ratified the convention uh, in April 2015. It was just uh, before um, election, uh, presidential election, and our previous uh, president, I think, he was hoping that uh, it will um, get him uh, more votes if he will ratify in the flashes uh, of media the convention, but unfortunately it was not the case, uh, he lost. Uh, and um, the uh, present governing um, coalition uh, get into power and we are facing since then uh, uh, the serious uh, backlash concerning women's rights and uh, violence against uh, women. Actually, our organization was, was one of the first, I think, victim of this backlash and because at the beginning of 2016, we were refused the uh, grant from the uh, government and the um, argument um, which were used against us was that we discriminate men, uh, not providing uh, services uh, as, uh, for men as a women's rights organization. Uh, and since then we never received the uh, uh, further uh, support from the, uh, from the government. Uh, and actually, uh, I think one of the also issue, uh, which uh, are part of the uh, fact that we have totally different perspective on seeing uh, violence, uh, domestic violence and violence against women, its causes, uh, consequences, and the way we should um, work to uh, combat and prevent uh, violence uh, against women. Uh, but also the, uh, uh, the previous president uh, actually uh, 
put the final uh, signature uh, for the ratification in our office. So I think since then also we were perceived by the uh, government as a big enemy uh, because we are uh, uh, in, as in a coalition with the seen as a coalition uh, being in coalition with the uh, previous government and as you know we have a very strong uh, now division between uh, and none of uh, not at all cooperation between opposition and the uh, uh, governing uh, majority. Uh, so actually, uh, just a few months after the uh, present go uh, government entered into power, uh, we heard the first uh, um, about the first attack on the on the convention. And there was a rumor that the uh, government wants to uh, withdraw our uh, ratification uh, of the convention. And there were some protests uh, on the street and in front of the of the parliament. There was a lot of media um, and criticizing uh, that. And uh, finally, they uh, denied that that uh, there was this attempt to withdraw our uh, signature. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but at the same uh, time, of course, all the uh, this approach to uh, to the legislation and uh, to women's rights was becoming more and more uh, conservative uh, in uh, Poland concerning uh, violence against women, but of course uh, one of the main issues was also reproductive rights and attack on uh, the present very restrictive legislation to make it more uh, even restrictive and to introduce total ban on uh, abortion. So these two issues were uh, at the same uh, time the battlefield for uh, our government and for women's rights organization to uh, to defend uh, these uh, rights and uh, also con convention. And um, for some time, uh, it was not an open uh, discussion about the withdrawal of uh, our ratification, uh, but at the same time, we have several um, members of the government and of our, our president and, uh, as well, saying that we don't need the convention uh, because our legislation is very good and so what for this convention uh, is for and this is ideological document and uh, uh, this wants to introduce very dangerous uh, uh, ideology for polish traditional families this is attacked on family and they want to introduce um, the uh, the homosexual marriages and Poland is against uh, that, of course. They want to uh, introduce um, child, uh, uh, child um, adoption for uh, gay people. So I don't know where they find it in this convention, but anyway, they were using this uh, argument to uh, try to frighten more conservative part of the society to, uh, to present it as a, as a very danger uh, for our values and uh, tradition. And, uh, but uh, apart of uh, this uh, saying from time to time uh, by quite prominent uh, politicians and as I said also my, uh, our president uh, from time to time, uh, there was no so open attempt again to uh, withdraw our signature from the uh, ratification. This uh, actually um, uh, became the, uh, the, the very hot issue uh, this year. Uh, just uh, at, the, at the beginning uh, of the year, more or less, and in the uh, uh, lockdown. Uh, actually, uh, the, there were various um, messages on the Facebook or uh, of vice ministers of the uh, just of, of the vice minister of justice, saying that this is time to withdraw our convention, uh, withdraw our signature from the uh, Istanbul uh, Convention. Uh, they were using very dirty and un uh, untrue words, um, uh, uh, trying to frighten uh, this uh, more conservative part of the uh, of the society. And um, um, few weeks later, uh, the minister of uh, justice. Uh, declared that they would uh, like to initiate a formal uh, document to withdraw our uh, ratification. And they did it. Um, and they sent it to the Ministry of uh, Family and Labor responsible for the, uh, for the convention, uh, which was also very um, supportive, the, the previous Minister of Family and Labor for this, uh, for this idea. 
uh, and uh, this was also the time when there were a lot of uh, political fights uh, um, between members of the governing coalition because there are three parties, one the big one, law and justice, and then the smaller one, uh, which are the, even the more radical than the law and uh, justice in this uh, respect. So the Minister of Justice is uh, uh, from this more radical even, uh, political party and they uh, wanted to uh, to get some point in the negotiation uh, after the, the new election we had uh, in uh, June, June or July. Uh, so this was the fight who will get uh, how many ministers or vice ministers uh, in the new uh, government. So they in, uh, started this uh, uh, this topic uh, just uh, at the same time of, of this internal fights uh, between uh, coalition parties. Uh, and they they send it to the ministry, so they formally initiated the uh, the process. And the uh, 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 law and justice, uh, which is the majority uh, party in this coalition, they uh, they were not uh, so much willing, I think, to uh, to raise this uh, issue because there were a lot of criticism and attacks by the media, by women's rights organization. We succeeded to organize. Uh, quite big demonstrations uh, in Warsaw and some other cities uh, against uh, that idea. Uh, so uh, the government decided to, uh, the prime minister, uh, who is from this uh, party which has the big majority in this coalition, so they decided to send it to the um, constitutional tribunal. And the constitutional tribunal uh, is totally uh, controlled by the government. Uh, because the uh, the chair of and the judges are appointed by this coalition, uh, 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 which is also uh, the issue in Poland uh, and not only in Poland but also at the EU level, because there were uh, uh, there are uh, cases pending uh, in Luxembourg uh, tribunal um, uh, against uh, the. Um, against Poland uh, for not uh, obeying the rule of law, uh, for appointing these uh, judges in the Constitutional Tribunal as, as well as uh, and then changing the law to uh, appoint the, uh, about the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, as well. So we have a lot of battles uh, and uh, political uh, battles to uh, get a full uh, power and actually, uh, my Hungarian colleagues said that there are a lot of similarities and Polish government many times mentioned also Hungary in Poland and uh, how uh, good um, they are in, in, uh, in the fight against these liberals. Uh, and this is the good, uh, and it seems that this is the example for uh, Polish go government to follow the uh, Hungarian and, and Russian uh, rule. And actually, the very danger uh, situation, dangerous situation in Poland is uh, concerning uh, convention that uh, we have this very radical right-wing group, uh, this is Foundation or the Juris. Some weeks ago, they started the uh, citizens legislative initiative uh, to uh, withdraw uh, our uh, ratification of the Istanbul Convention and to replace it with the uh, uh, Convention for Family Rights. Uh, yes, so, the, uh, so this is uh, still, uh, I mean, this issue of uh, withdrawal of a convention on, on one uh, hand, it's pending in this constitutional court, uh, totally uh, controlled by the government, so they can uh, uh, take this issue anytime they want and uh, the way they want. There will be the decision, but at the same time, I think it's quite dangerous this initiative of Order Juris because also this is very powerful organization, and some of uh, their members are uh, now in the uh, Supreme Court, uh, in the Ministry of Justice, and so they are they are very in influential. And if they succeed to get a uh, hundred thousand signature, uh, so this uh, draft law will have to be reviewed by the Parliament. And again, it will depend uh, probably how strong the different uh, uh, groups in the governing coalition are. Uh, but also Polish church is supporting this uh, initiative, which is also, as you uh, know, very influential in Poland. So I think this is really a situation, although some 
a little bit suspended now uh, with this direct withdrawal of the ratification, uh, but still we are uh, unfortunately in the, uh, uh, the process, we don't know how it will end. And we still have a lot to do to adjust our legislation to the EU, uh, to the Council of Europe uh, Convention standards. And of course, we totally disagree with our government that we have such a wonderful legislation and we don't need convention. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, we have completed the first part. We already uh, went to the open forum, but uh, could you please all this uh, all our panelists could you please open your uh, open your video and we can have a uh, photo Özlem can we have a photo I'm on the fifth page please smile Beşinci sayfa gülümseyin Thank you Thank you Thank you um, thank you Ursula yes um, this whole uh, turning gender into family, like Professor Gerhard also mentioned, is a big issue here. We used to have a ministry called Ministry of Women, which has now become the Ministry of Family Affairs. So it's very much continuing on a similar strain in this region. Um, I will give the floor to Pille, who sent a message, uh, who's the Vice President of the WAVE organization. Pille, are you here? Can you hear me? sure that or, or repeat that yes uh, umbrella organizations are also a very important uh, part of this trying to fight in international level so and and uh, us together with uh, women's lobby in europe and around we are always ones who are supporting you but in local level unfortunately we cannot uh, do much to support you from outside so next, I know that tomorrow we are the European Commission Vice President and we are having constantly like meetings in Strasbourg and, and uh, Brussels too. That uh, angle that please don't, uh, please don't uh, get smoothened up or please don't get convinced by men's or family rights organizations. But uh, yeah, together we have the fight. Thank you. Sorry, can I, thank you very much, Pidle. Um, can I say, please, anyone who wants to speak, can you write in the chat on the right hand side so I can see uh, who wants to carry on uh, speaking? Göksel, Göksu. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, can I say that this has been a great panel, a great meeting, uh, very enriching for me. I, I believe everyone will agree with me when I say this. Very briefly, I am, if I may, uh, I would like to propose uh, two recommendations. We've listened to many examples from many countries, including Turkey. And there is one common basis that is uh, conservative, a conservative, uh, but uh, otherwise uh, the countries governance structures, ideologies, religions are different, but the same, ba the shared basis is a conservative movement. So uh, we are uh, staging an important fight as women against uh, this conservative basis, regardless of our countries. Therefore, uh, when it comes to what we could do on this basis, uh, my uh, humble proposal will be uh, based on the discussions I've been able to fo follow. Rada said something very important in her speech. Uh, right-wing movements are stealing our techniques, she said, not our agenda, maybe. Uh, she's right, very right. For many years in Turkey, we have been witnessing this concretely. Uh, all NGOs are cloned and uh, a conservative uh, NGO, other conservative NGOs uh, are popping up like mushrooms uh, based on the to act uh, to counterbalance them and uh, they use our techniques the uh, of course their agenda is different their ideologies are different in fact uh, they um, meet our agendas with other agendas but they use the same techniques they refer to our poets our uh, words even they own these and just to take the opposite perspective uh, why are we not attacking that 
perspectives uh, that basis or could we brainstorm a little about how we can do that just what i mean is turkey uh, defines itself as a muslim country and in any european country women uh, do you uh, base yourself on the same basis as women in turkey could this be an argument to stage another struggle or uh, just in the contrary direction, you, you call yourself Muslims or uh, you, you say um, the heaven lies beneath the feet of women. You have such arguments as well. And uh, now you have all these uh, virtues for women. Are you becoming a part, if you uh, advance these arguments, are you becoming a, a part of this Christian uh, structure. That's just one idea. It's of course it's just my initial thoughts. But could this be perhaps be a basis for another area of, uh, as part of our battle? So that's um, one question I have right now. And secondly, you have one more minute, Yoksa. Uh, uh, and Gehars talked about uh, the, the emphasis on family members. We are all aware, but could we perhaps um, design an attack that uh, refers to that uh, with a great bait weight and perhaps we could base our uh, uh, battle on this. Thank you very much. Uh, Gülizar Ipek wants to take the floor. Gülizar, thank you very much. This has been a very fulfilling, a very a uh, nice meeting, uh, Poland, uh, Croatia, Hungary, Bulgaria, when we look at their uh, experiences. Yes, Radha, thank you very much for your participation. but i hope we will win as usually we do i love you all and send all sisters hugs and and i just i'm thank so you. happy this is really very important meeting and thank you all for sharing thank you thank you thank Participate. you so much thank you bye 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 ben devam edeyim mi arkadaşlar can i go on Yes, please, go ahead. You have three more minutes. Well, when we look at all these uh, states, we see that women are in, enslaved, uh, alienated, excluded. Uh, the moves are the same, the planning is the same, Turkey, Poland, Bulgaria, uh, Hungary. It's all the same, but what we should do most critical thing, despite all the attacks, uh, violence and harassment and um, the, the rapes facing women, we all need to come together. Uh, just like Karl Marx said, all uh, workers should come together. We should come together as women and those um, who have signed the agreement at the convention and uh, women in the signatory states should come together in, uh, should unite in a single platform and uh, some planning should be done together. This will uh, make our voices heard more because in um, an action in Turkey, if it's the same as all these other countries, in Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, um, Croatia, this will make waves and this will show that women are capable of coming up with shared plans against all these, against men. And because uh, every move against women use family to legitimize itself, to legitimize uh, its violence and the cases are the same. Therefore, we need shared planning. And I believe we are capable of acting together on the same, uh, based on the, this shared plan. Thank you. Uh, international relations committee of ESHIC, a women's platform of equality. It's good to see our sisters from European Women's Lobby, uh, Rada, uh, Reka, Eniko here. Thank you so much for your contribution. As European Women's Lobby, we have been working on uh, Istanbul Convention since 
uh, its start. Uh, and also we have this Observatory on Violence Against Women, which was established in 1997 uh, after the Beijing uh, action. So we have been uh, working at the front of EU and international uh, levels uh, to fight against um, violence against women altogether. So today within this meeting, I think we have started uh, a very important initiative that we have been trying to, you know, work within our coordination and also at European, European Women's Lobby members throughout 2000 membership we have in our uh, national coordinations. So I think it's the right moment to trigger our memberships, to trigger our existing energies and existing work, which is very important to contribute to rule out our national battle to give strength to Istanbul Convention. Our suggestion would always be to work within the EU uh, legislation, EU advocacy as well, because as a candidate country, Turkey, Western Balkans, and also existing members of the uh, European Union, Poland, you know, Hungary, Croatia, it is very important to remember the role of the European Union, why it is established and why it is there to strengthen women's rights at all fronts. So e right now, as European Women's Lobby, we are lobbying and we are advocating for a legislation on uh, tackling slowly only on violence against women. So we are demanding from the EU institutions to work on such a directive and also to back up to Istanbul Convention, of course, not a replacement, but to make it more stronger at all levels so that EU member states will not be able to run away, you know, for not ratifying from Istanbul Convention. So we are trying to close the back doors that they are trying to create. As Salma, as Rada, as all our members have been, speakers have been approaching the right-wing conservative bloc, which is happening right now, is also the reflection of what feminist organizations are trying to, you know, it's the negative reflection of, of what we have been trying to do with Istanbul Con Convention. So actually they are reflecting on what we have been doing positively. So they realize the impact of it and within their arguments, I don't want to go to, into the negative arguments. I think the positive arguments that we have already through Istanbul Convention is very important. European Women's Lobby has had a uh, shadow report for Gravio where we had found out of 23 countries who have ratified Istanbul Convention out of only I think 22 of them has the response saying that 96 percentage of legislation and policy improvement was provided due to Istanbul Convention's existence ratification by those countries. So there's a great Aslan impact Hanım, that Aslan we can Hanım, use. Bakmayın. Aslan Hanım, son bir dakika bir, ikincisi bir de çevirmenlerde no. düşünür olursunuz. Sorry, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry, uh, you have uh, just a uh, few moments left and also the interpreters are trying to catch up at the forefront uh, advocating for that and um, on the eu has launched a report on turkey's progress turkey counter report and there as european women's lobby coordination for turkey we have put istanbul convention first time into the how it was attacked by the government it was very important so it was seen so it is very important how eu institutions how policymakers are making our case visible at their work. So it is a gendered perspective of all policy levels at the national level and EU and international level is very important. We have to go for that too within our Çok work. And, and thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt because the three minutes uh, is over. Rosalind Park there is next on my list. Like to take the floor. Thank you. I'll just, I'll just make it short. Uh, I put in the draft convention of the rights of the family into the chat as a file in English. It's also available in a couple other languages and that's linked as well. If you read their section on prevention of domestic and violent, domestic violence and violence against women in the family, I want to echo what Gokshal had said, that they copy us. They are citing to the Istanbul Convention and those parts in their own convention on the rights of the family. So trying to give themselves more credibility and legitimacy so anyway, just to be aware of that when you look at that. Um, I did want to ask if people could share whether offline or else during this about promising practices and successful strategies that have worked for the ratification. We've talked about the challenges, but I know there are so many positive ways. There are good messaging examples that countries um, that have used. And I know that the square peg doesn't always fit the, the round hole in other country contexts, but maybe there's a way that we can learn from each other and adapt those. 
Thank you very much, Rosalind. Uh, may I please remind people that this is a translation uh, meeting and please to think of the translators when you talk, not to talk too fast. Uh, thank you very much for your input, everybody. And on my list is Figan Erosan. Hello everyone, thank you very much. I'm uh, from the Woven Women Solidarity Association. I want to mention the following because what I realized from your uh, comments is that the methods uh, adopted by men or those who are attacking the convention, they all adopt the same approach and same political arguments, which means that there's a systematic ac attack against women's gains which means that we have to adopt a more holistic, more integrated and more complicated uh, platforms to come together as all women. And we have to develop a more holistic strategy, a policy maybe. Isn't that right? Uh, we shouldn't really focus on seasonal or uh, these kinds of temporary uh, common platforms, don't we need more, uh, more permanent platforms or networks uh, to be together, to act together? Uh, we have this in our country, uh, this situation in our country, and we have the same situation in other countries. And if we have a network, for example, uh, we could act together and we could uh, put in place the same actions across a number of different countries. Uh, we have 25th of November approaching. Uh, what if we were to uh, all go down to streets and defend Istanbul Convention? Uh, because Istanbul Convention must be defended. We can develop a defense for uh, Istanbul Convention. Can we not uh, organize and design um, a, a plot, a political uh, argument for that? Thank you very much, Vegan. And I think that's what we want to achieve here on this platform. Uh, we want to achieve a common uh, platform, a common ground. Parliament, women parliamentarians um, helped you to push back against the back backlash to the convention. Um, and whether, um, to what extent the cooperation between the parliamentarians and the um, members of the women's organizations that fight against the pushback um, was successful. Um, and to Rosalind's point, I think in Turkey we did, um, as an as a example of success, successful um, campaigning, we did a social media campaign. Um, I think it started on Instagram, where we posted um, either black screens or, or, or our photographs as bl in black and white and we could we were able to reach a wide audience um, from us from other european countries that supported um, our message uh, message to fight against violence against women and message to support the convention thank, thank you your is your question in particular to somebody um, so I think one of the representatives left, but um, I think Hungary's representative Rika is here. If if she's here, or Poland, or um, Poland representative, are they still here? Yes. Uh, Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for the question, and uh, yes, it raised my interest too because uh, what we have seen is that in the in the past uh, years. Uh, a lot of uh, opposition MPs in favor of the convention, even across party lines, uh, they have uh, made several uh, initiatives uh, like um, interpellations and uh, proposals for decisions within parliament within the parliament. And uh, um, for example, in 2018. Um, uh, it's noted down here, two proposals were submitted to adopt a parliamentary decision for speeding up the ratification process. Uh, two such proposals uh, at the, in the same year. And all these proposals were actually uh, voted down uh, by uh, the majority uh, party uh, to prevent the parliament from even discussing it. So it didn't even reach uh, 
the main uh, plenary. Uh, this, mm, you, you should see that in, in Hungary, the, the majority of the uh, ruling party is so big, uh, now it's back to two thirds, uh, that uh, mm, they easily uh, mobilize uh, their members uh, in such cases. Also, uh, this is what made it possible to uh, to, to pass the, the, the declaration, the political declaration in, in May, for example. And uh, we really uh, recognize and commend these, these uh, female uh, MPs and some male MPs actually that stand up uh, for uh, fighting against uh, violence against women. Uh, even in new, so even in uh, other forms, so not only focusing on uh, the Istanbul Convention, but if they have the means to, uh, to for example, uh, look at um, uh, several relevant other laws, they, they uh, try to do uh, a lot in that field. And often they just uh, face such opposition and such force uh, that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to exert any influence, unfortunately. So in, in, sorry, in some cases, maybe some suggestions go through undercover, in a way, in an unacknowledged uh, way. It, it's uh, possible, so it happens. Thank you, Rekha, very much. And uh, now, Julia, Julia Gülbar. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your presentations. I'll be very brief. I'm going to talk to you about a campaign that is going on in Turkey. Uh, it's a call on to the parliament to uh, get on call. As the uh, monitoring committee uh, of uh, SEDAL, Turkey was one of the first countries they visited. They uh, issued a report on Turkey in 2015. It was a comprehensive report uh, about uh, violence against uh, women. Uh, and what the Turkish government needed to do uh, to uh, fully implement Istanbul Convention. Unfortunately, it hasn't been translated into Turkish officially yet. And the Article 76 of the Istanbul Convention requires uh, Parliament to carry out uh, audits or inspections. So uh, they are, the parliaments are required to monitor the implementation of the convention and they have to discuss the relevant reports at the General Assembly, at the parliament. That is why on the first of, starting from the 1st of October, during this legislative term, uh, we will monitor what is being discussed and what is being done in, at the parliament in Turkey. Uh, we estimate that nothing will be done because of the current conservative government. They'll get zero uh, as a grade, we know that. Uh, they'll score zero, but uh, it is a way to raise awareness among the opposition parties. Uh, it is a way to raise awareness in general, and it is a reminder for the future parliaments, for future governments. And I think uh, a uh, call on the parliament to get on call, to be on call, is quite an important campaign because one man governments sometimes try to um, uh, this, uh, make uh, parliaments dysfunctional. Uh, and this is a campaign uh, undertaken by women to bring the parliament to the forefront. And it goes uh, far and beyond the women's uh, movement, as a politician colleague uh, mentioned quite rightly in a, a meeting yesterday. So in our capacity as a chic platform, at the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, we asked, uh, we request to organize a, a special agenda meeting. And that is why we contacted, we are trying to contact MPs from PACE, uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. You know that they are represented by MPs uh, uh, of uh, each member country, uh, which means, uh, and they have to strike a balance. So the more the current government is conservative, the more there are members at the PACE from the opposition parties. So PACE uh, had made a very important declaration about the Istanbul Convention. In Poland and in Turkey, they uh, said 
uh, there were important counter attacks against the uh, attacks against the convention and they said in that declaration that uh, the entire community uh, societies must carry out activities on the 25th of November we supported that call uh, that declaration and that is why on the 25th of November we uh, demanded the parliament to hold a special uh, session Selin Sayek Böke, uh, a member of PACE, uh, was in a meeting yesterday with us uh, in our capacity as ESHIC platform. And Ms. Uh, Sayek Böke told us that not just as Turkish women, but as European women, we can come together with the PACE uh, uh, members from Europe, not just from Turkey, with male and female uh, parliamentarians from pace we could come together Selin Hanım told us that's quite important we are, are ready to host such a meeting with them and if we can succeed in uh, creating a common platform for uh, Istanbul Convention uh, we can come together with the European uh, parliamentarians uh, before the 25th of November because those parliamentarians those MPs will go back to their countries after that meeting and start discussing issues uh, related to Istanbul Convention and I believe that for the European women's movement that is quite an important opportunity to uh, be able to organize this uh, joint meeting with the PACE MPs so that is my suggestion my uh, uh, proposal in this meeting and in all countries we're talking about laws or legislation being local and national that's an ideological attack on uh, universal uh, fundamental human rights and that is not only the case in Turkey that is not something peculiar to Turkey but we see this happening uh, across a lot of countries that is why uh, international women's solidarity must focus on bringing to the forefront universal values and we have to emphasize the fact that we are a universal power we can do that maybe on the occasion of the 25th of November. We were also discussing uh, within a chic, maybe wearing uh, uh, the same mask, same type of mask, and creating a family album, taking a photo and sending it uh, in support of Istanbul Convention, uh, also in support of uh, men and women's equality. We could ask that to all activists, politicians, and uh, celebrities uh, to create this family uh, photo album. Uh, we were thinking about this idea uh, for Turkey, but what if we did this in all of the countries? So in all individual countries, we could say that we are local, we are national, uh, and that would represent an international answer to those ultra uh, conservatives uh, in all of our countries. So that is my proposal uh, for the platform. Thank you all. Thank you, Hilya. Excellent ideas, really. Next up is Gülfer Akkaya. Good evening, all. Thank you all. So I've been listening to these women that I don't know at all from all these different countries, and I remembered early uh, 20th century. These protests of, of women, which uh, spread to the world like wildfire, defending uh, rights such as right in education, right to work, etc and, and this feels quite like it even if we don't know about what each other is doing we are doing similar things without knowing it that's what i thought of and again heard women in whose countries uh, there were things happening that were similar to what was happening in my country that i didn't know about uh, regards Istanbul Convention and the attacks on Istanbul Convention and I heard similar arguments not women but family so uh, trying to uh, put a cover on violence uh, domestic violence because of the, the, the concept of family etc etc there are so many commonalities across the board we knew about those things we really uh, could guess what was happening so there's nothing uh, quite surprising really but I was still surprised to see such similarities so many similarities and everything became crystal clear for me and I realized uh, that uh, I was clearer about why men were such so much against Istanbul Convention and adoption of Istanbul Convention and 
I think that enlightenment should happen with all women uh, in whose country the Istanbul Convention is adopted or is to be adopted. Even if we uh, live in different countries governed by different uh, governments, different political parties, we are under a systematic attack by men and we have to be able to describe this voice this on the common platforms and to be able to explain and defend why Istanbul Convention is so important and why we will never ever give up on it. We should prepare a, a joint a declaration in uh, different languages, uh, definitely in German and in English, and everyone should have that declaration in their own countries, in their own uh, uh, languages, and everyone should uh, have the chance to be communicated this message. And it is of utmost importance, of importance, I believe, to share this with the media, to share this uh, with all of the women. I was so excited. I was uh, really moved by going back a hundred years. You have one last minute. We need to organize uh, amongst each other internationally. We have to come together, come side by side uh, via networks, on networks maybe, just like men do. Uh, we should make these calls uh, as often as we can. I do agree with that proposal and on the 25th of November, yes, we should be on the street, but we should be at the parliament as well. All of the uh, peasant countries must make their moves. And Julia was saying, uh, was talking about a family uh, album. Let's just abandon the word family. Let's call it something else, whatever you want, but just not family. Let's not call it family, please. Because we're talking about women uh, being subject to violence, uh, being exploited, and let's not use the word family and justify their cause. And yes, there is uh, an attack by men. We have to stick to each other uh, as women, but we have to organize internationally as well against this attack by men, but we have to uh, be uh, as active as possible at local level. We're already doing that, you will say, yes but we have to have links with the international uh, platform, international networks we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your input. Next up is Zeynep Gökni. Hello, uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Gary, Zeynep Gökni Chanal, both a uh, Turkish Women's uh, Association and uh, a Capital uh, Women's Platform uh, are my the organizations I am a member of. Planned action against women by men from all sorts of different ideologies, religions, it doesn't matter. They are doing this because they don't want what we have so far achieved or any more. So we need to get together as women of the world, not just this region, and um, tell them that we have their doing. We have to be assertive, we have to be um, demanding, and uh, we have to forget about things like cultures and um, you know, the little bits and pieces, scraps off their tables. We have to demand our right as half the population of the world. And we have to do this seriously. This is all I have to say. Thank you everyone very much. It's been a terrific meeting. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we wish you a speedy recovery, Kaspes. Hello? Well, most of the things I wanted to say have been said by uh, Hulya Gülefer uh, Gülbar. Global uh, capitalism is attacking women together, all together. And in order to fight back, we need to set up uh, women's uh, international moments. This could be the first women international, perhaps a starting point for women international or feminist international. Uh, uh, it would be important to say, take steps in that direction. And uh, as Gül Bahar and others uh, mentioned, uh, most of the things I wanted to say, um, I, I just want to say that I agree with them. Uh, long live Feminist International. Thank you. Sevda Karaj asked to take the floor. Sevda, good evening, everyone. 
Uh, thank you, Ashik Group work uh, King, uh, group uh, for uh, bringing us together as part of this meeting. Thank you for your efforts in this organization. Well, my question is uh, related to one of the critical points related to Ashik uh, Group. In fact, I uh, believe that we should share this point with other uh, colleagues uh, in in Turkey, every organization, every um, a member that forms the ASIC platform uh, is present all around the country in different regions in Turkey and they have separate work. May, maybe they come from uh, different ideological positions. Uh, they may have uh, different priorities or have um, different working methods. I will, uh, one of uh, the, the primary point that brought these uh, 300 organizations together was about uh, the, trying to equip uh, child ma marriage through uh, child, uh, child abuse through marriage and also attacks on the Istanbul Convention. And in order to um, stage this fight together, all together, as women coming from all these different parts of Turkey, we found this common basis for us to work together in Turkey. And in fact, we noticed that uh, we may have different techniques, we may have uh, uh, different areas of work and groups that we're working with or be gathering uh, with different women. Ali, can you allow me to speak? Well, in fact, this uh, showed us that uh, uh, there is a strength uh, to have different women that are uh, who are parts of different movements uh, in in this struggle together acting together and i would also like to ask a question uh, when we have the, all these attacks uh, on uh, the istanbul convention high on our agendas uh, perhaps looking at uh, uh, taking a broader uh, perspective in terms of gathering women uh, that are parts of different groups, not only women's groups. Uh, what, are, what is your experience perhaps with groups that don't have as much knowledge about uh, the Istanbul Convention who are against, uh, maybe women who are against um, uh, this hatred, this anger, uh, but who voted for conservative parties? How did you involve them? Or uh, what were your ex what was your experience and techniques in broadening uh, this space for our discussion for this debate? And I also would like to ask you another uh, question. Oh, well, these fathers' rights groups and men's rights groups and uh, women uh, who are fighting for Istanbul Convention for the convention. Uh, it seems that, uh, that that there was an example. We listened to an example where the government. It's almost pitting these two, two groups uh, against uh, each other. And in your lobby activities, uh, were, were you aware that this would be the case uh, in your relations, lobbying relations? And how did you take this and how did you uh, meet this? Thank you uh, all very much for your very valuable contributions, uh, inputs. Thank you. And Rekha said she has to leave. Could we okay, but thank goodbye? you, Rekha. Bye-bye. Uh, is there anyone who can answer Sevda's question? Did anyone get the question? If there are no other questions, I would now like to ask, to, ask Zehra to deliver the closing remarks. Gül asked for to take the floor. Gül? Is it Gül Erdos? Gül Evren. Just a final question at the last minute, but one, uh, two of our guests have already left. If you could convey my question, my first question is about uh, platforms such as Eshik. Are there uh, platforms in their country like ours? And if yes, uh, would it be possible to organize as soon as possible a meeting with them and us? Or if not, if they're not present, could they take the initiative to organize such platforms? Why? Because uh, there were uh, proposals for an international moment uh, or unity. I think it would be easier to uh, implement this between ESHIC to organize this 
Therefore, could you convey my request to them? Thank you very much. This is a good idea. Of course, we will convey your request. If not, Zehra, can I ask you to deliver your remarks? Uh, my name is Beri Sönmez. I would like to uh, submit a proposal. I am um, hesitant in a way that that would be misunderstood because I, I will talk about Fatma Gül Ber Berta. Uh, Fatma Gül, uh, Professor Fatma Gül talks about patriarchal reformation. Um, if it, uh, the patriarchy is losing ground against the gains made by women, they come together regardless of their uh, ideology, religion, geography, region. Uh, uh, there are similarities between conservative policies, Croatia, uh, Hungary, Poland, and Turkey. If we leave conservatives uh, to their um, fate, they, they would fight against each other, but when it comes to sexism and uh, being against women, they unite, easily unite around the same rhetoric. Uh, for example, family rights is something they're trying to introduce and our ombudsman uh, equality institution organized an international family rights conference and there were participants from those other countries. It's been a few years since then and against their uh, approach i think we should do things that uh, will they make their arguments uh, invalid i'm sorry if i'm speaking too fast if that's hard for the interpreters i will slow down well based on the family rights uh, against the family rights arguments uh, it could that be an alternative that the istanbul convention uh, saying that uh, Istanbul Convention is not ag against family, uh, but it will, it has the possibility to make families safer because it will rid the families of uh, violence. If we could uh, support these arguments in these different countries with this type of rhetoric, perhaps it would be easier uh, for a conservative women who are not part of feminist movements and we would make their contributions easier too. My proposal is that before the November the 25th and after that in our joint action maybe it would be good to emphasize that the uh, convention is not against the, the families, uh, against the concept of family in our rhetoric. I would like to thank uh, all the participants. Can I take the floor Esra because my, earlier my microphone was not working. Thank you very much Berinana. Yes. Uh, during the Istanbul Convention discussions uh, and uh, we, are, we are given as a reason uh, to withdraw from the convention the LGBTI community not only in Turkey but also in Hungary and Poland as well. Uh, I especially wanted to thank Rada for her uh, presentation and talking about LGBTI, uh, the situation of LGBTI community in uh, Croatia, Croatia, I guess. Am I right? Yes, I guess. Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, we already know that we, we are facing the same discussions and situations as, as LGBTI community in different countries. Uh, we would be very pleased uh, to be in touch. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer and I'm vice chair of one of the biggest and largest and oldest LGBTI organizations in Turkey. Uh, we are working for 26 uh, years on LGBTI rights. Uh, so we, we would be very pleased to keep in touch with you on future collaborations uh, when it comes to LGBTI discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yasemin. Perian Yilmaz is no longer connected, I believe. Then I'd like to leave the floor to Professor Zehra. Thank you very much. Zehra Kabasakal Arat is a pro professor of political science at the University of Connecticut, where she also contributes to the human rights and gender studies programs. She studies human rights with an emphasis on women's rights as well as processes of democratization, globalization, and development. 
She's engaged in various human rights advocacy groups and professional organizations, including serving as founding president of the Human Rights Section of the American Political Science Associations. Thank you, Zehra. Floor is yours. Uh, well, on behalf of another thing which was not on my bio, I'm, I'm a member of ESHIC as well. So on behalf of uh, ESHIC, uh, I would like to thank you all of our speakers, participants, uh, uh, for sharing their observations, thoughts, um, uh, some creative uh, methods of uh, struggle and advocacy and suggestions. Uh, I would also like to thank our moderators, as well as uh, friends who worked behind the scene uh, and made this happen. Our translators, our uh, uh, technicians, <laughs> that's not their work, but they assume that uh, position. And uh, those who worked on the media um, uh, products as well. Uh, I just want to add something for our um, uh, uh, international uh, audience that uh, ESHIC is a platform composed of uh, uh, over 300 uh, women's and LGBT organizations and we have over 100 uh, uh, other organizations that are not a part of it but a supporter. And uh, I want to stress that what we did here today, uh, just getting together around the common cause and sharing our experiences and views is an important achievement in itself. But we, in, as the organizers in ESHIC, uh, consider this just a step. It is, uh, we expect this to be the first step, the beginning of a continuous enterprise of feminist solidarity. So our next task is to formulate strategies and plan actions that would establish a network. A network that would support women across borders and enable them to carry out their activities within their own countries more effectively. And this network would also support women's groups, uh, uh, would, would also unify um, national and local efforts and make them heard and recognized at international forums and intergovernmental organizations. And this was the expectation of ESHIC but I sense in this meeting that it's a um, shared expectation, a common sense and, uh, sentiment. Well, I have to note that it is like when I was asked to uh, offer some concluding remarks at the end of the meeting, I was told not to deliver a pre-prepared speech, but pay attention to what's being said here and highlight some common proposals. So uh, before I attempt to fulfill my really easy task of offering a short summary of a very long uh, meeting, and also thank you for your patience for those who are still hanging around, uh, I would like to note that uh, also coming back to Ishik, that Ishik is interested in informing the press and populations of all of the countries represented here today um, about this meeting, that it had happened, and as well as our intention to collaborate, not only to defend Istanbul Convention, but also to seek the expansion of the ratification and have it fully implemented where it has been already ratified. So among the things that are proposed today, our sisters mentioned also a preparation of a declaration that would lay out our common goals and demands 
uh, with an uh, emphasis on the Istanbul, Istanbul Convention. Uh, the announcement of this joint declaration can be coordinated to take place simultaneously in different cities and towns as uh, our friends also uh, brought up uh, the need to have some sim simultaneous uh, uh, events. And uh, it might be possible to also organize the announcement of this declaration along with some other events during the November 25th, December 10 period of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And uh, I, was, I was also trying to follow the chat in addition to the conversation here. The, and uh, uh, Özlem noted that the, we may be able to produce something by uh, next week to uh, uh, work on um, as a common uh, statement. And also among joint uh, actions, it was suggested to have uh, on the 25th of November, or maybe again, one of those days, one minute silence, uh, meeting with the, uh, uh, some again, uh, parliamentary uh, uh, coalitions with PACE perhaps, and uh, during this period or before. And uh, also in these uh, various statements and actions, uh, it is indicated that we should note that we are not necessarily uh, against family, uh, just perhaps a certain form of family and, I, uh, inter and Istanbul Convention is not an anti-family. Uh, convention to uh, address some sensibilities about, uh, again, within uh, conservative communities and to uh, side and support uh, 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 some, again, sisters within those communities. While these proposals appear to be uh, kinds that we need to implement soon, Today, we also heard some others that would require some long-term planning. And um, uh, among them, again, as much as I could gather, it, it, it was rich <laughs> the meeting, uh, mobilizing uh, feminist parliamentarians, uh, not only within their own countries, but also across borders. Rana mentioned about the impact that he uh, made when she went abroad while she was not necessarily uh, 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 revered as such within her own country. And um, it was suggested to exchange information about some good practices, some positive examples, uh, perhaps uh, some, again, uh, successful uh, interventions to um, achieve ratification of the uh, convention. And um, what Julia mentioned, a few things that we are doing as ESHIC uh, uh, these days, uh, we don't know how successful they will be, but if they turn out to be as such, they may constitute some uh, good practices. And it was suggested to uh, exchange uh, reports that we prepare and also uh, establish some joint uh, monitoring mechanisms. And uh, within that, some uh, uh, mentioned about uh, collaborating or sharing, uh, collaborating in producing or sharing shadow reports uh, for uh, Gravio. Um, and then, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, like the is is issuing some joint reports uh, uh, and harmonizing our activities in uh, general uh, and uh, monitoring the parliament uh, within our own countries and uh, 
and uh, establishing again the communication and solidarity with each other to that end. It's also suggested that uh, we use the current structures and uh, knowledge of certain transnational organizations. Uh, WAVE was mentioned within that context, uh, 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 European Women's Lobby, and so these are already there. How can we uh, join our forces uh, together? Uh, now, as we are confronting patriarchal violence, masculine discourses and attacks on our hard-won rights, we need to design a plan of action. This is my summary of some of the things that are uh, put together. For collective action, that goes beyond reacting to some daily attacks on our different rights from different directions. Um, and just fighting the backlash and fighting misinterpretation, we need to be proactive and think about systemic, these attacks as systemic, although they come as scattered from different directions and design a plan of action that would pressure national parliaments and governments to adopt and follow universal principles. And here as a human rights scholar, I will add my little thing, equality in dignity of human beings. And we should also be proactive in pressuring international organizations and agencies, especially we mentioned in this context, European Union and PACE to uh, develop the legal uh, framework to give force and power to uh, uh, Istanbul Convention and uh, for all of these national and international groups to take gender equality seriously. Um, now, uh, all of these, of course, would require more meetings. And uh, some colleagues uh, also the, uh, uh, touched upon that, more of those and so. And uh, perhaps I will suggest that such meetings would be organized by women's group, groups from different uh, countries at different times. And uh, we would make the organization uh, of such meetings more effective and allow the implementation of the proposals mentioned so far uh, uh, through the establishment of a core transnational team that would assume the role of coordination. I think this must be our first task to work and establish such a coordinating uh, group. Um, now, no struggle for equality, justice, and human rights has been easy or complete. All of them were subject to reversals as well. Now, our already difficult task is now further aggravated by the rise of overtly hostile and misogynist and homophobic and transphobic groups into power. Uh, here I want to open a little parenthesis that in fighting the misrepresentation of Istanbul Convention, the uh, misinformation about it as being uh, anti-family and uh, pro-homosexuality. We have to be careful in our defense of the convention that uh, we should not uh, sound as anti-LGBT and uh, we have to at every opportunity express our solidarity. Now, um, 
in this environment that is like uh, the when we have these conservative uh, reactionary i might say groups uh, assuming power not just working from the fringes but uh, the in top of the state apparatus uh, this shift uh, makes our transnational solidarity and the need to work in concert in tandem more important than ever they add the fact that we call it backlash but this rise add urgency to such solidarity now uh, how do we advocate gender equality when rule of law and democracy are undermined. Under these conditions, it is hard to escape a sense of frustration and dismay, I have to say. However, today, I am leaving this meeting with renewed hope, energy, inspiration, commitment and as ready to challenge our challengers and i'm confident that i'm not alone let's continue in solidarity and sisterhood let's fight the good fight and thank you all for coming and joining this effort we will stay in touch to work on these various proposals and new ones and have a good night and stay safe. In Thank you, way. Zeta, very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Zehra. It was a great closing remarks. I'm really a, a goose. I had goosebumps. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this is the, we have come to the end of this meeting. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, I think uh, hours. Uh, thanks for all the participants, all the speakers, moderators, interpreters, uh, all the statements, uh, all the contributions. There are the, the, all our sisters made great contrib contributions. So I really like your statement, Zera. Challenge our challengers. Yes, we are ready to challenge them. So thank you very much for coming, for attending. This is, uh, we are closing uh, our meeting now. So thank you uh, and good night uh, to all.